Hi, this is Ruth, and here is my audiovisual sidebar to accompany my article on spinal fusion that will appear, I believe, in the March-April edition of Massage and Bodywork magazine. I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity to share with you some information about why spinal fusion surgery is considered sometimes to be controversial and some of the decision points that make it difficult to determine whether the surgery is likely to be successful or not. So according to a very useful website called Spine Health, a spinal fusion surgery, quote, is designed to stop the motion at a painful vertebral segment, which in turn should decrease pain generated from the joint, unquote. So the assumption here is that excessive motion, or let's call it instability, generates pain. Uh, can we go along with that assumption? And we have to ask the question, is it appropriate to do this very invasive procedure to treat degenerative spine disease if we aren't 100% sure that instability is an issue? Some super smart people, specifically named White and Punjabi, this is a study cited in an e-medicine article called Spinal Instability and Spinal Fusion Surgery Clinical Presentations that's in the bibliography attached to my article. So White and Punjabi have defined spinal stability in this way. Quote, spinal stability is the ability of the spine under physiological loads to limit patterns of displacement so as not to damage or irritate the spinal cord and nerve roots. And in addition, so as to prevent incapacitating deformity or pain due to structural changes. So in real person language, this essentially means that stability of the spine means we can withstand physiologic loading in such a way that we don't damage or irritate the spinal cord and nerve roots. Okay. Another e-medicine article explains the pathophysiology of spinal instability, and I thought I'd share it with you here because it is fascinating, and it could provide some insights for what our clients might be going through. In this view, the pathophysiology of spinal instability is based on regional spinal issues. Now, I have a vertebra here, and it's not a human vertebra. I don't actually have any spine models here at home. But what I do have is this. This is a vertebra I picked up from the beach from a seal. And just to get us oriented, here is the vertebral body. Actually, I have a pointer. Here is the vertebral body. And uh, here's the spinous process, and here is the vertebral arch and the lamina. And this, of course, is the vertebral foramen where the spinal cord goes. Now, this vertebra, you might be able to see, this has foramina in the transverse processes, which makes me wonder if maybe it was a cervical vertebra, but I don't know enough about seal anatomy to say for sure, but I'm pretty sure mammals just have these foramina in the cervical vertebrae. So in the approach I'm describing, this this spine is divided into three zones or three columns. And the anterior column consists of the anterior two-thirds of the vertebral body. So that's here. And this would uh, include also the anterior aspect of the intervertebral discs and the annulus. And it would include the anterior longitudinal ligament, which runs here on the anterior side of the vertebral bodies. The middle column consists of the posterior wall of the vertebral body. So that's here. And the posterior aspect of the intervertebral disc. So that'll be here, including the annulus. And the posterior longitudinal ligament, which runs down the back side of the vertebral bodies. That's the middle column. And then the posterior column refers to the whole vertebral arch and all of the ligaments that support it. So we have the lamina and the spinous process and the interspinous ligaments and the uh, facet joints, 
all of these help to comprise the posterior column of the spine. So when two or more of these segments or these columns fail, and the definition of failure is not included in this discussion, well, this is what we recognize to result in instability. Now, I have to assume that that means instability with enough play that neurologic tissue can be damaged or irritated. An anterior column failure, so that's a problem here on the front side, um, might include things like damaging the anterior longitudinal ligament, compression fractures, having an anterior disc protrusion, or spondylolisthesis, where a vertebral body pushes way forward and so on. Middle column failure might include things like a postural lateral disc bulge, compression fractures, other disruptions to that part of the spine. And a posterior column failure might include things like bone spurs in the vertebral foramina or cracks in the lamina or other disruptions that might happen around the vertebral arch, including problems with the facet joints, which could then put us into the realm of things like arthritis or spondylosis. So <clears throat> Punjabi and White also defined instability. They defined stability, right? Meaning being able to deal with physiologic load without putting damage or it, it, without creating damage to nerve tissue. Their definition of instability is this. They say instability, acute or chronic, refers to excessive displacement of the spine that would result in neurologic deficit, deformity, or pain. Right. So According to this point of view, we define instability when excessive displacement or failure of two of the three spinal columns leads to neurologic deficit, deformity, or pain. And that explains that assumptive leap from instability to pain generation. And as we've seen, spinal fusion surgery is designed to correct spinal instability. Hopefully we know ahead of time that it is spinal instability that is definitely contributing to that neurologic deficit, deformity, or pain. But this paradigm has some problems. Firstly, the current definitions of spinal instability are not uniformly accepted. Plus, it's difficult or impossible to measure a person's level of instability. And then we have this pesky problem that the scientific literature about spinal fusions and its effectiveness for pain management and increasing function, that research isn't terrifically consistent. We know now that pain is so much more complicated than just a biomechanical disruption. While structural problems may be an initiator, we see that other factors also contribute to a person's experience of pain. And for some people, these other factors outlive biomechanical corrections, and that might have something to do with why 20% of people who undergo this procedure don't get relief. All that said, you know, basically I want to express a sense of conservatism about this surgery, but I also want to recognize that for many people it is a godsend. In 2007, an article by a New York Times reporter named Gina Colada questioned the effectiveness of spinal fusion surgeries. And this report, made, which was based on four clinical trials, made big headlines and it had a lot of repercussions and it cast a lot of doubt over the use of this procedure. And as I worked on this column, I came across a response to that article pointing out that it was based on a small amount of good information and also pointing out that this doctor, at least, who was writing the response, felt that spinal fusion surgery carefully and skillfully applied is a life-saving intervention for people who have no other options. Because we're better at managing this surgery and its potential complications than we used to be, it's certainly a safer choice than it's ever been. Still, while 80% of patients report some reduction in pain, that means 20% of the people who go through this do not have a favorable outcome. I was happy to interview a dear friend who had a wonderful outcome with her spinal fusion surgery, and here's what she had to say. 
So it is my great pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Diana Thompson. Diana will be familiar to many readers of Massage and Bodywork because she is a frequent contributor and used to write the research column. Um, and, uh, you know, I could spend another half hour on all of her credentials and um, ways to talk about what a great person she is. But in the, sh the, the shorthand version of this is Diana is a past president of the Massage Therapy Foundation. She has been very active in volunteer service in all aspects of our profession. Um, she, uh, and she is a veteran of uh, spinal fusion surgery. And so I wanted her to share her experience with us so we can get sort of the inside scoop on what that was like. So Diana, can you tell us a little bit about um, when your surgery was and what led you to make the decision to go ahead and do that? Yes, happily. Um, my surgery happened the day after Christmas in 2014. I um, had been experiencing some really severe arm pain and neck pain off and on for actually for several years. Um, but I was increasingly trying to get another MRI uh, with my neurologist that I had been seeing. He was a pain doc and he was great at referring out to complementary care. And um, he said, because I was, you know, happy and still working and, you know, showing up in the office conversant that he just didn't think it was that bad. So, um, so I went to another neurologist, got an MRI, and um, we discovered that these two car accidents that I had been in in the 1980s, 1983 and again in 1985, where I had shattered the windshield with my head in the first car accident. I went through partway um, up to my hips, which got caught by yeah. the steering wheel. Yeah. Thank goodness. Um, in the second one, it was safety glass. So I just shattered it and came back in um, to my seat. And the progression over time was that the herniated disc had ruptured and calcified over time and that the bone spurs were flattening my spinal cord. So I oh no God. longer had a round spinal cord inside my foramen. Um, it was flat at two segments. What were those segments? Uh, C5, 6, and 6, 7. Oh. So the lower part of the cervical spine. That's correct. Yeah. And... Um, so once those results came out, then everyone was on high alert. The doctor who ordered it asked me if uh, I wanted him to call an ambulance and take me straight to the doctor, just to the hospital for emergency surgery. I dropped it off at my previous um, doctor. He called within 20 minutes and said the same thing. Um, should I call an ambulance? Evidently, the risk was that I could be paralyzed, that um, the flattening of the spinal cord was so severe that it could, with any sort of um, fall, and it was winter time, mm -hmm. um, and I had slipped on the ice the week before, yeah. and, you know, luckily, I was fine. Uh, but any light car accident, any slip and fall, anything like that could result in paralysis. And your main symptoms were neck pain and, and arm, ar which arm do you remember? It was my left arm. Left arm. And uh, any other things that would have made you think that your spinal cord was actually being flattened? You know, I didn't know of anything else um, after the fact when they started asking questions about bowel and bladder control. I'm like, oh my God, yes, I have lost bowel control. And, um, and I just thought of it as, you know, am, am I really getting old? Like I can't be getting so old that <laughs> I don't have any signals that I have to go to the bathroom. 
but um but that's what it was like and Mm -hmm. evidently um because that has all gone away that was a direct result of right so let's talk about that all going away part do you first of all um how did what what kind of approach did they use for your surgery it was an anterior approach can't see a thing that's massage on a daily basis. <laughs> I was going to say, I bet, I bet you got some massage on the front of your neck. I did it every single day. Uh-huh. I just gently skin rolled as soon as I could. Um, I had a friend with me in the hospital who was very um, conscious, wouldn't let doctors do anything or nurses do anything to my neck that might damage my tissue. She Mm -hmm. stayed the night with me. Um, Somebody wanted to put tape over the whole thing after he pulled the drain out and she's like, stop. She literally grabbed his hand at the last minute because he wasn't paying attention to her. And, um, you know, there's just certain things I think that can really preserve the tissue there and movement mobility is one of them. Yeah. So, um, do you know what they, what they, did they put a spacer in or did they just, I mean, how did they fuse? Do you know what materials they might've used? They used a cage. Oh, uh-huh. So the cages between the two and filled the cages with, um, cadaver bone. Okay. So I know you looked for some images to share and we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't find any, but you have hardware in the front of your neck. I do. I have two plates, eight screws, and two cages. Oh my goodness. Wow. And so, um, did it, you said that your, your, your bowel dysfunction, which was not so much losing control as just not being sensitive and that, that got itself sorted. It did completely. And how about your arm pain and your neck pain? I woke up in the hospital that day and besides throwing up on everyone, I had no pain. Wow. The doctor walks in. I'm like, look, doc. And he's like, stop. Don't. <laughs> don't do too much. I'm like, I'm so excited. I, can... <laughs> I don't have any pain. And it wasn't just the painkillers. It was, it was really no. the, the in, in this case, it was a pretty straightforward biomechanical pressure. Thing, in fact, is... my pain meds were dripping on the floor. Oh, wow. <laughs> the nurse did not get it attached to the catheter. And luckily, a nurse friend of mine walked in about an hour into my recovery room stay and said, um, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting any payments. I know. I wasn't. Wow. But I felt great. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. It was amazing. And so in, in, in the follow-up now, we're a few years later, because that was 2014, you said, right? Yeah. So yeah. Well, we're we're coming later. up on your sixth anniversary. Yeah. And what kind of repercussions do you have from this next surgery now? You know, I'm impressed with how much mobility I have. I think I'm doing very well. Um, what I have to do is not turn my head for any long period of time. So sitting next to somebody at the dinner table, I can't turn my head to speak to them. I have to turn my body in the chair. And uh, in my own house, in my living room, I get swivel chairs um, just so that I can turn to look outside, look at the television, have conversations with people and not exaggerate, exacerbate the pain. Yeah, there's not uh, there's no looking at someone like this for a while. Nope. Yeah. No, because that movement t- seems to happen at the lower part of the cervical vertebrae. Mm-hmm. If I just moved at the top, I'd be okay. Um, but that's not the common way. You have a good workaround. And so when you get massage for your neck now, what kinds of accommodations do you expect or ask for your therapist to make for you? Um, well, I really hope that most people don't do extreme ranges of motion for anterior neck work because I need a lot of anterior neck work. The scar tissue in there 
on the surface is very loose, but they're still very deep right. um, attachments that must continue to be worked on. And, um, and if they do, then I have to stop them mm -hmm. right away and, and correct them and just ask that we not do anything in any extreme ranges of motion. So, you know, I can do it but you have to take me right back out of it again. Right, right. But that's an interesting point because I think a lot of people, this is specialty work, right? Working deep in the anterior triangle. This is not something for people who are undereducated or dabbling. Right. Um, but for someone who's had the kind of surgery you've had, this would be really, really important. It is. So a great skill to add to one's collection um, if we have cervical fusion it's veterans. Yeah. coming to see us so yeah and scar work needs to be gentle i mean i think we think scar work because the scar tissue gets so gnarly but especially when you're working with fresh scar tissue the more gentle you are the more responsive and long lasting the results are right I think. right yeah this is a this is terrific this is exactly what i was hoping for so thank you so much diana thompson and um why don't you just give us a 10 minute, or sorry, 10 second, 10 second <laughs> pitch for your wonderful project? Well, Hands Heal EHR is an electronic health record keeping system that is all encompassing. There's a patient portal so they can go in and participate in their charting with pre and post measures. Um, there's insurance billing in there, which is incredibly easy and helpful if you're even thinking about going into that. And um, there's a scheduling system. So it's really all encompassing. There's wellness notes, treatment notes. You can easily write progress reports in there and, um, and find everything you need. Diana, thanks again for yeah. spending a few minutes on this. Really, hey. really appreciate it. Thank you.